morning. It is so great to see all of you today, whether you're here in person or you're at home still watching with us online. We invite you to stand this morning. We have so much to be grateful for, don't we? From Psalm 95, 6, it says, Oh, come and bow in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Let's lift our voices to him. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great. You conquer, you great, you free, free captive, and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great
be changed simply by being in your presence this morning. We proclaim these truths that we know. We cry out to you in your name.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the creator of galaxies we haven't even seen before. Our cameras don't reach that far. But we thank you for the promise of eternal life through our son, Jesus Christ. We pray a special anointing in Pastor Steve's message this morning on your prophet Haggai. We would ask that it touch lives and touch hearts as the message is, is being relayed. We thank you and we pray all this in the name of your name, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Promises can be hard to keep. Have you ever noticed that? Like that, you know, I, I promise to not watch the next episode without you. I promise. I, I promise that I will love you as you get older and never stop watching, playing video games. I promise. I promise that I won't eat the last cookie unless I can't help myself and I do and then I eat it. I make promises all the time and sometimes I have trouble keeping them. And yet it's interesting how many promises you'll make in a day. I mean, really you think about all of the times that you use your credit card. That's a promise. The promise is that you're actually gonna pay for what you just charged. Anytime you fill out a contract or an application, you're making some kind of promise. And it's interesting how many promises there are in the Bible that are directed toward us, and in turn, the promises that we should be making back to God in response. I, mean, it, it, I think that's really what the book of Haggai is all about. It's showing that God has a promise for you and me, and yet will we reciprocate in making a promise to trust him with it? So if you brought a Bible or a device and you want to turn with me to Haggai so you can follow along, we're going to jump into Haggai chapter 2 today. Last week we talked about how important it is to have priorities that are according to God's design. And Haggai was reflecting on all of that, on all of that. He was measuring for them what is important and then building your foundation for life upon that, which is most important. Then he also, though, did this, he talked about identifying problems in your life and then gave great consolation and advice on how to fix them. That's really what this whole story is about, the story of God's people. If you were to read the Old Testament from, from, from Genesis through Malachi, you'd see it's all about God's relationship intersecting with his people. And and let me just bring you up to speed on Haggai before we start the reading today. Uh, if you weren't here and weren't able to remember, in 583 BC, the Persians were holding captive all of the Israelites. And it was at that time that they pleaded with King Cyrus to let them go back and build their wall and rebuild their temple. You can read all about this rebuilding the temple period in the book of Ezra. And so he allows 50,000 of them to go back to Jerusalem to start building this, this temple, because laying there in ruins, the Babylonians had come in and destroyed it years earlier. And, and so their job, according to King Cyrus, was to get that thing rebuilt so they could worship their God. The problem is their neighbors, uh, the Samaritans, weren't really fond of this project, didn't want to see them rise back up into power, and so they complained about it, played a lot of political cards, and the construction was stopped. And for 15 years, they did nothing on rebuilding the temple after building the foundation. And, and, and it's interesting then, this, this next king comes along, King Darius, and he says, you have now permission to resume the building, but 15 years had passed, and men and women, you can develop a lot of habits in 15 years, and you don't like those habits upended. And this is what happened to God's people. They had become accustomed to not working on this, this temple, accustomed to building their own houses and their own lives, and they really weren't ready to dive into this. They really were filled with, here it is, spiritual lethargy. They stopped caring about the worship of God. Enter Haggai, the prophet. Haggai confronts the people about this spiritual lethargy and their lack of desire to not only not worship God, but to not follow God's commands. And he gives, uses this statement over and over again in his little short book, Give careful thought or careful consideration. In other words, he's simply saying, think about it. Think about what you're doing with your life and what God designed you to do. He focuses on their apathy toward the worship of God, and he challenges them to think about their priorities in life. I mean, honestly, just hearing that introduction, you could press pause and say, what have I made most important in my life that I'm passionately pursuing? Well, after telling them to bring back the worship of God to, their, to the central part of their lives, he says this to, the, to Israel's leaders, and this is where I want to pick up the reading, chapter 2, verse 3. 
Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Now let's pause there and see if you can say the word out loud, covenanted. I practiced and practiced. I just can't get it. But it's the most important word in the passage. It's all about the promise God made with his people when they escaped Egypt and slavery. God reminds them through Haggai, it's a promise he's kept. God renews this promise through Haggai that he'll continue to keep it. And his promises give you and me strength and hope and peace. And I want to talk about those three things that jump out from this passage this morning. The first thing, his promises give you strength. I mean, interesting, the three categories of people God addresses through Haggai in this. He says, first, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the head of the, pro the, the rebuilding project of the temple. He was the contractor of this temple building process. And then he says, Joshua, son of Jehozadak. He was the priest. He was the one who would be in charge of handling all of the worship for the people, guiding them in it, leading them in it, offering whatever needs to be offered. And then he gives this promise directly to the people. And he says, be strong, for I am with you. He associates their inner strength, their ability to persevere with their recognition that he is present in their community and in their hearts and lives. Now, it's interesting because other translations than the one we read today, the New International Version, other translations say, be courage, courageous or take courage in this moment, where others say, be strong. Ultimately, the promise of God's presence is the message that our physical, emotional, and spiritual courage can come, no matter what our enemies do, no matter what our circumstances are, if we'll acknowledge the real presence of God in our space and in our life. That's what he's saying to them through Haggai. And of all the promises of God, men and women, his presence is the most important. Us realizing that he's real, active, and alive in our lives. It's not just that he exists or even that he's in the midst of his people. When he declares his presence through Haggai, he declares his blessing and involvement in every area of their lives. And that's why it's so important. Ultimately, what God is saying to them is, I promise to keep my promises. That's what he's reminding them of. This is what I've covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. What was the covenant promise of God when Moses led his people out of Egypt? God promised the people that if they trusted him, worshiped him only, and obeyed his commands, he would always have his presence and his blessing on their lives. Those three things are it. The covenant had not changed despite the disobedience of the people in Haggai's day. Now, when they obeyed, God's blessing was on them. But when they disobeyed, God would inflict some kind of correction upon them. And sometimes, men and women, that correction took hundreds of years for them and their generations after to understand the reality of God's presence and power. Now, notice how God opens this promise. L let, me, let, me, let me paraphrase it. You've really messed this thing up. 
This thing is in ruins. My temple's in a wreck. It's rubble. It's actually even nothing. But he offers them this. Be strong, everyone. I haven't forgotten my promise. The problem is you've forgotten your promise to me. You see, it's not that complicated. And because his promise can be trusted, once you get back to his commands, you'll see a real turn in the circumstances of your lives. That's what he's saying to them. It may take a while, but stick with me. And then he adds this emphasis. Here's what he said. And my spirit remains among you, so do not fear. Now, now look, no matter what the challenge is or struggles, if you put your faith in me, my promises are there for you to enjoy. My promises are there to give you courage and strength to walk through any struggle. And that hasn't cha- changed. Trusting in his design and his commands and his promises will give you immense strength. But what is that strength he's talking about? Well, he's talking about the perseverance of faith. That no matter how difficult things get, you will have the ability to continue to trust him in this bo- broken, fallen world. You know, I've I I was thinking about, as I was reading this passage and preparing for this, immediately one guy came to my mind, was a friend of mine from Clearback in my church camp days. Uh, Terry was a buddy of mine. We both gave our our life to the Lord the same day. And and he kind of disappeared from my life, and I continued to go back to that camp. As I became a pastor, a preacher, then they'd invite me back to be, be part of the ministry team there. And, and one night in the middle of camp, we're just sitting around the campfire, kids are talking about the Lord, out of the darkness appears Terry. I hadn't seen him in years. And he, he knew I would be at camp, and he came up to me and said, man, I need someone to talk to. Well, I'm like, if you, know, you appear out of nothing, yeah, I'm going to do that. And, and so we walk off, and he says this. He says, I've really messed up. Did you hear that? He started with complete honesty. I've really messed up. In other words, Terry's temple was in ruins. And he said, I'm I'm being honest with you. I'm, I'm afraid to come back to God. And I said, well, sometimes, Terry, fear can be a good thing because fear is actually what can draw us to God. But I'll tell you what you really need that you've already demonstrated, humility. When you come to God and honestly confess that you've messed up, confess that you're afraid, when you humble yourself before him, he can really begin to work with that. When you admit that your temple is in ruins, God can really start to bring you the strength that you need in your life. Years later, uh, Terry found my number. I hadn't seen him then since that night. And and it was many years later, and he called me up out of the blue, identified himself. He said, I just want you to know that that night changed my life. And I have found a strength in my life, I'm not afraid anymore, that I never had before. And and it was a great conversation to hear the, the revolution that had taken place in Terry's mind and in his heart because he first came confessing, I messed up. You see, when you let God's temple lie in ruins in your life, you're going to start to wonder why you should believe in him in the first place. And and I've noticed, like, uh, uh, these quotes come across my news feeds all the time on social media, and and one of them, you've probably read it, I, I got that, I think is so true. Courage is not the strength to go on. It's going on when you don't have the strength. And that's exactly what God is promising his people through Haggai if they'll just be honest and get back to work on the temple that's ruined in their community and ultimately in their hearts. When you rebuild God's temple in your life, his promises give you strength to believe and courage to live the life he designed for you. In other words, 
the courage or strength to obey his commands in a world that disregards them. And when you respond to his promises, you will see he's true and best and right and good, and you'll want to do nothing more than, as Haggai said it, get to work and rebuild this temple that you've allowed to lie in disrepair. So think about it, Haggai says. And now jump down to verse 6. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea, and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desired of all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. You see, just from hearing that right there, not only does he promise them he'll give them strength, but his promises also give hope. And, and wow, in the world right now, there's nothing we need more than the hope of God. <laughs> One of the greatest assets of a promise from God is the security of the future. You can be sure God has control and has a plan. I mean, let's think about it, people. He's the sovereign God of the universe. Trust me, he can get his sovereign will done even though he's dealing with a bunch of messed up people. He's capable. And the best part of God's control, he loves his people. With all of his power, all of his knowledge, all of his ability, he loves you. And everything his plan is about is in your best interest. It's in the best interest of those who trust him and who will surrender their will, their temple, to his will and his glory. Now, now let's do a quick rewind here because I want to make sure you get all of this in context of what Haggai the prophet is saying. You may remember the, the Babylonians came in, crushed the Jews and, and destroyed the temple and took them off into captivity. Eventually, the Persians destroyed the Babylonians and now gave the Israelites permission to come back to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. They kept messing up along the way till eventually the, Rome, the Greeks and then the Romans invaded and occupied and took over their land and their control as well. You see, but before the Persians were even conquered, Haggai said, I will shake all nations and the desired of all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. Now to me, that's an interesting promise. All the nations of the earth will now become aware of God's presence when they get this temple built. Now, the English translation of this is interesting. We just read it uh, in, in the NIV. It said, the desired of all nations, while other English translations say, the wealth or the treasures of all nations will fill this temple. And then he goes on to say, the silver is mine, the gold is mine. It, it, it's a twofold meaning, men and women. Everything in the temple that the kings of the nations gave to them to build it belong to God. That's what they need to understand, that even in all of their work, all of their effort, what they're building belongs to God. The life you're building belongs to God. But it's interesting that he says, the desired of all nations. It's a term that's used for the Messiah. The desired of all nations means that which the people really need, that which the people really want. Because you see, we can chase after a lot of things in our life that make promises to us that they don't keep. But the one who always keeps his promise is the God Almighty of the temple that we're building, a temple of worship. And Haggai declares God's promise that the temple not only represents his presence, but his salvation. All nations will come to know his desired, Jesus, the Messiah of the world. Now, he's promising his people they will get their temple back 
when they return it to the glory of God that he deserves. Now, remember, I, I just want to remind you over and over again when I use a phrase like that, the glory of God that he deserves, it's why you live and breathe. It's why God put you on this planet. It's why he made matter that, that forms your body and your mind and your spirit. The whole reason you exist is the glory of God. That, that's why you're created. And if your temple of worship is in ruins, you can feel hopeless. What's the point? No great future. But when you learn to trust and experience the promises of God, your purpose is renewed and your hope is renewed. Now, now look, I have to be honest with you. I've been with people when they got the news, sitting there in the doctor's office next to them as the doctor explains, you're not going to survive this. It's terminal. And I've watched their response to this, and they've talked to me about it, and they say, uh, Steve, I'm not afraid of dying. I am a little concerned about what I'm going to go through till I get there. But ultimately, they have no fear because the promise of God gives them hope. And I've stood at the bedsides of some of those people, and there's a big difference between people who have put their hope in the God of the universe, in Jesus Christ, and those who have rejected him and therefore have no hope. That moment where they're coming to meet their destiny is so different in terms of their spirit and their ability to handle it. The, the hope of all of their family can be shattered because they've rejected this God who wants to build a temple in their heart and life. It was the hope they gained from Haggai, the mouthpiece of God's promises that gave them the resolve to rebuild, and they did. And men and women, those promises are here today for you. He offers you that same hope that same opportunity to re rebuild your life if you found yourself walking, running, wandering, whatever you want to call it, away from him, he's ready for you to come back home and rebuild the temple of hope. And ultimately, not only does he give you strength and hope, but his promises give you the experience that you're looking for more than anything else. And here it is, verse 9. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty, and in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. You see, not only does, do his promises give you strength and hope, his promises give you peace. Now, I want to just say, have you noticed how in just these few sentences, over and over and over again, Haggai says, declares the Lord Almighty? Am I the only one who picked up on that this week? Declares the Lord Almighty. You see, it's interesting. It's a statement like this that honestly confused them. When God promised peace, they immediately defaulted to a physical peace on earth when the day came that they believed they were going to be large and in charge, when they thought they were going to set up a political and economic and military kingdom and they were going to control the whole planet, that's what they thought he meant when he said peace. But God was focused on, here's how he put it, this present house and this place, meaning the temple at that time in their generation, while it was sitting there in rubble. He was saying, my presence and my glory will give you peace, personal peace of heart, mind, and spirit. And through the desired will come peace, your peace. But it was all contingent upon them putting God in his proper place in their heart, and in their community. You see, for these Jews, 
rebuilding the temple meant restoring the worship of God to being central in their lives. But for you and for us, changing our minds about living for self and putting our faith in the desired of God, Jesus Christ, the one that's giving him even greater glory than he did in the day of his temple, is what Haggai said. In this place, I, the Lord God Almighty, I will grant peace. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Whether you're aware of it or not, the number one thing you're looking for in this life is peace is a knowledge and a feeling of contentment and satisfaction and security or safety in your life. It's the number one thing you're after in your life. We can experience that kind of peace no matter the circumstances surrounding us if we'll just think about it. I mean, think about it. Wars all over the world going on. Maybe more will begin to happen, and yet when we know him, when we've made him central to our life, when we've built a temple of worship to him, we can have peace in the midst of wars. Pandemics or health problems, we can have perfect peace because we have made him the Lord of our personal temple of worship whether we're having family problems. Those are the problems that we can't control sometimes. I mean, brokenness, and we can't control the behavior of other people, and we wish so much that relationships were restored. And he says, but if you put me, the center of your heart and life, I can give you peace in the midst of all of that family struggle, financial struggles. I mean, he is, in fact, the God of a cattle on a thousand hills. He can provide whatever you need to do his will and bring him glory. And with that then, even in the midst of financial struggles, he can give you peace. They're all real. Problems that are all tough, they can be very stressful in your life. And yet he says, rebuild the temple and I will give you peace. That's interesting. When the Lord is central in your life, he promises this comforting peace. And, and I just I often am reminded of a serious challenge in my own life. And I was reading again this week, um, back in Xenia, Ohio, in April of 1974, we had a horrific F5 tornado come through our town and destroy over half of it. And a guy named Steve Adams was the worship pastor of First Church of the Nazarene in our town. And that day at 4.40 p.m. on April 3rd, he was in the Adair Furniture Store downtown when the tornado came through and the entire building came down on top of him. Now, he survived and he was able to crawl out of the rubble and wasn't sure what to do in that moment as he looked around and saw a city completely devastated. So he began to walk toward his church. It was about a mile away. And when he got to the church, it also had been completely destroyed. And, and Steve said a couple days later, he went with the senior pastor of their church, Pastor Howard Rickey, to that store where he had been buried. And as they were looking at it, and Steve was telling Howard the story, some National Guardsmen that were there who were going through the rubble to try to find the remains of people um, heard him tell that, and they said, you were in there? And he said, yeah, and he said, you were the last one we were looking for. Everyone else in the store died. And it's interesting, Steve said, as I stood there and looked at all of that rubble and thought of all that death, Pastor Ricky looked over at me and he said, Steve, God doesn't promise to take us out of the storms of life, but he does promise to be right in the middle of them with us. And, and it's interesting that Steve began to reflect on that, that storms will come, no matter if they're natural or, or even God's judgment. And when it happens, you make sure that your temple is already built that you've already established who is central to your life. And you dwell on his promises, 
his presence, his love. And when storms wreak havoc, he gives peace. And so later, Steve wrote a song called Peace in the Midst of the Storm, which was recorded by a number of Christian recording artists. And, and here's just the first verse of that I want you to hear. When the world that I've been living in collapses at my feet, when my life is shattered and torn, though I'm windswept and battered, I can cling to his cross and find peace in the midst of my storm. You see, the desired of God, Jesus Christ, came along later, hundreds of years later after Haggai, and he said it this way. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. In other words, when Jesus is your central focus, he is the place of worship, he is the one you worship and trust and live for. The creator of the universe, who has no greater love for you, died for your sins and rose from the dead and made you a promise that if you trust in him and believe in him, you will have eternal life. He can be trusted. He can give you strength. He can give you hope. He can bring you peace right now in this moment and rebuild your temple. He says, trust me and put me at the center of your life because I've promised to give you strength to persevere. I promise to give you hope for eternity and I promise to give you peace in this life you now live. So think about it. Is it time to rebuild the temple in your life and make Jesus the center of your everything? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I need you to remind me today of your promises and give me strength and give me hope and give me peace. And I pray, O oh Lord, in the midst of all that we see on our news feeds and all that we experience in our homes or work or relationships, that you would bring to us all we need to give you glory in our life. Some people today, Lord, need to confess that they've messed up. They need to come humbly before you and seek your grace and forgiveness and start rebuilding the temple. I pray you will help everyone hearing this, experiencing this right now to be able to do that. Help them to pray for your grace and forgiveness. Help them to receive it. And today, make you leader, Lord of their life. Lord, help us to respond the way you want us to. In Jesus' name. Now, will you pray your own prayer, your head bowed? You call out to God, what is it that you need to confess? What is it that you need to do to humble yourself and rebuild your temple of worship? You respond right now in your own time of prayer. and Ask God to heal your heart and rebuild the temple in your life. You pray. Thank you for these promises that give us strength, hope, and peace. And we pray, O oh Lord, that as we uh, prepare to leave this place and live a life of worship, that you would empower us with your Holy Spirit to do it for your glory. We're grateful for this word that encourages us and reminds us that no matter what storms or challenges come in life, you are there in the midst of them. 
giving us all we need to honor you. So hear our prayers, hear our songs, see our lives, and use us to lift up the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together, and you stand with us at home as well, and and let's continue to worship him with this song, but make it the prayer of your heart. If you want to come and kneel and pray, you've got something you need to give to him, you can do that here, you can do that at your chair, home at your couch, but use this time to really respond in worship and honor God with what he has to say to you through his word. this space or in your space at home, singing the goodness of God means in every place that we go, whether we're at work or school or with friends or family, let's continue to sing the goodness of God. Now look, 
There's a lot of things that can make you promises to give you happiness and satisfaction. But there is nothing greater, no greater promise you can rely on than trusting the Lord, his commands, that they're best for you. And I pray that you'll do that. Thanks so much for being with us on our live stream. We hope uh, that you'll stick around for just a second as Jeff gives you some other ways that you can respond to what you experienced today. We love you. Thanks so much for staying with us throughout all of this year. We're looking forward to days ahead with you. God bless you. Have a great week.